And it's just going to take me a minute. I have to change my screen here. And unfortunately, I'm locked up. I can't do that. Give me a minute because I lost access to the file that I, here we go. I lost access to the file that I wanted to get to, to uh, read Matt's bio. So I just have to navigate to it. Sorry for the delay. Okay, I'm ready to, to talk. Uh, I think many of you know our member, Dr. Math, Math, Matthew C. Perry. He is a scientist emeritus from the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. Dr. Perry's love of birds was a constant throughout his life and resulted in him choosing to major in wildlife management at the University of Rhode Island. He also earned an MS degree in wildlife management from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and a PhD in avian science from the University of Maryland. Matt served as an officer in the U.S. Navy during the mid-1960s and spent many hours cruising off the coast of South Vietnam. Later, Matt worked at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Laurel, Maryland, where he conducted numerous research studies, mainly in waterfowl nutrition, Chesapeake Bay ecology, and in the management, restoration, and creation of wildlife habitat. Matt's last official research projects dealt with the study of sea ducks in the Atlantic Flyway, which included a nutrition study of captive ducks and a satellite telemetry tracking study with wild ducks. Matt retired after 45 years with the federal government, but as an emeritus scientist continues to publish research articles and recently completed a research project in Argentina dealing with satellite telemetry of ducks. Matt is a founding member of the Prince George's Audubon Society and a longtime member of Patuxent Bird Club and MOS. So it's certainly a great pleasure for us to, to have Matt to speak with us tonight about his studies on Chesapeake Bay waterfowl. Take it away, Matt. Thanks a lot, Marsha. It's a real pleasure uh, for me to be talking to you folks. Uh, going to start off with the, one of my favorite pictures of the chalk tank with some uh, at that time, whistling swans and a little skipjack headed home. That's the old bridge at the chop tank, which is now a fishing pier. <clears throat> I think most of you are pretty familiar with a, a lot of the basics on the Chesapeake Bay and uh, what a unique estuary it is, a good mixing pot for the fresh and salt water. You know, most of the fresh water comes in from the Susquehanna, about 50% of it comes in from the Susquehanna River, but it's a great mixing pot with all that salt water coming in. On, on each tide. And this makes a tremendous area for productivity, which makes it so attractive to waterfowl. So historically, it's been a huge uh, area for wintering waterfowl and some breeding birds, which I'll talk about. But uh, a lot of it is due to the fact that the depth is only 21 feet, the average depth. So there's a lot of good shallow areas for the, for the waterfowl to feed on. And I'm gonna get into some of the uh, food habits uh, which has been a major part of my research uh, over the years. I just mentioned briefly about the early uh, observations by John Smith and other naturalists. Uh, they, they just uh, were amazed on how much uh, wildlife there was in Chesapeake Bay. And he, uh, Smith talks about the swans, geese, and ducks, uh, and how they were so numerous that it looked like you could almost walk across the bay or across a river on their backs because there were so many of them. And I think a lot of you have heard the stories about how the sky was blackened with birds and during migration and all the other great tales. The problem is, is that we don't have good data from those early days. And I'll talk more about the survey data, but one of the things we do know is that there was, everybody was talking about the great abundance. And John James Audubon, of course, was one of the early explorers and ornithologists. And he was funded a lot by the Europeans who were so interested in what we had in North America. Because a lot of the Americans at that time were just trying to eke out a living. And so a lot of the money for the early exploration of the naturalists and all came from European sponsors and, and John James Audubon was uh, one of them. But uh, later on, uh, Stuart Udall, who was uh, Secretary of Interior under uh, Kennedy, he talked about the myth of superabundance. And uh, that was in his book, uh, Quiet Crisis. And, you know, the, that book in Silent Spring and uh, 
Paul Ehrlich's uh, Population Bomb with three books that greatly affected me when I was doing my undergraduate and graduate work back in the 60s and in and and, and the 70s. And it's, and it's just amazing when you think of some of those early warnings that we had about uh, populations, wildlife populations and our own human population. A lot of those have gone unheeded over the years. And we're still dealing with this problem that we think of wildlife as being so ab abundant that it can't be uh, exterminated. Back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, we had market hunting costs and Chesapeake Bay was one of the major areas, a lot because of the huge populations of canvasbacks. And so uh, that's one of the basic things we have to think about in Chesapeake Bay is how many birds there were here, waterfowl, but especially the canvasbacks and how important it was for the big city markets because the the United States was pretty uh, well off in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and people were living really well. And even in Europe, we were sending uh, canvasbacks to the crown in England so they could have canvasbacks on their diet. You know the story about passenger pigeons and how they darken the sky. And the same thing can be said for the waterfall in Chesapeake Bay. A lot of the uh, market hunters used guns that could kill hundreds at a time, but then the sport hunters <coughs> were using <coughs> techniques that uh, now are outlawed, like a sink box. That's a metal container that was at water level. They uh, put decoys, wooden decoys all around it, but on the actual aprons that came out from the box, they put steel decoys and that kept the weight down. Needless to say, it was a pretty dangerous thing and a lot of hunters uh, would end up getting drowned or losing all their gear because if a wave came up, it could be pretty bad. And of course, the first thing you do is get rid of all your uh, iron decoys. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act <clears throat> was passed in 1918, and that protected all migratory birds. It's a major factor of protection that we have, and all other work that we do and other aspects of uh, migratory birds are based on this. During the last administration, they tried to weaken it by taking away the clause that deals with take. T-A-K-E. It's a very important thing that we constantly be aware of because there's still factors out there that want to take this away. And what this means is it directs, directly uh, mentions the fact that it doesn't have to be an intentional kill of migratory birds, but an unintentional kill, whether it be from a wind turbine or a skyscraper or uh, some of the uh, oil spills that are on these holding ponds, People who are res responsible for those can be held liable for take. And uh, the new administration has re put that back into the law, but now Congress is trying to pass a new act that would give that more protection so it can't be a political football that goes back and forth. So the main thing about the Migratory Bird P Treaty Act is it protected all birds and it even protected uh, all the swans. And at that time, they didn't specify because this was before the mute swans had come in, but it prohibited the trade in all migratory birds. This is where the kindergarten teachers get into trouble sometimes when they ask their kids to pick up feathers that they see on the ground because that's actually illegal. And uh, so that's some of the, some of the uh, parts of that have been uh, criticized because it is so protective, but it's one of the things that has been come down for many years as being very important to migratory birds. And of course, plume hunting, with the uh, women's hats and other decorations was a major problem in the past. Of course, then we went through the Dust Bowl era in the 30s and the 36. We had drought, drought and the misuse of the land and also at the same time, a lot of wetland drainage. The government was paying to have wetlands drained so we could have more productivity on the farms. So this is when the conservation movement really started with wildlife. You know, wildlife profession is relatively new we had back in the early 1900s, a lot of the people involved with ornithology were actually MDs. They were doctors that were interested in birds. But it wasn't until the 1930s and Aldo Leopold and some of the other early biologists got involved with actually having uh, good uh, courses in college in wildlife conservation. <clears throat> and so that all came out of the, the drainage and the uh, drought problem. And a lot of conservation groups like the National Wildlife Federation and Ducks Unlimited were founded back at that time. 
Roosevelt in the uh, late 1930s brought Ding Darling from Iowa to be his chief of the biological survey. Ding Darling was a cartoonist. He was very well known nationwide because he was a conservationist as well as being a big hunter. But he criticized hunters who were not good sportsmen. And this got Roosevelt's attention. He brought him to Washington and he was very effective in his job. Unfortunately, he only stayed a couple of years because he didn't like Washington and he didn't like his job. So he wanted to go back to the newspaper business and, and do cartoons. His assistant at that time was Ira Gabrielson. So Ira Gabrielson became the chief of the biological survey after Ding Darling. But the next year, Gabrielson became director of the Fish and Wildlife Service when it was created in 1940. And so there was a major change going on in the country at that time. Before 1940, a lot of the problems, a lot of these situations with wildlife were considered the problems that wildlife was having on humans. Then that all changed when the Fish and Wildlife Service was created and all the wildlife work was taken away from agriculture and then went into the interior department on, with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So at that time, then we're starting to think about the problems that humans were having on wildlife. So it was a major shift that took place in 1940 with Ira Gabrielson coming in. And Darling kept writing uh, his cartoons that became famous nationally and uh, talking about extinction, which people hadn't been used to hearing about, and a lot of the other problems that wildlife was being affected. Uh, actual surveys, aerial surveys began in the 1930s and Fred Lincoln in the center there was the major person in, involved with a lot of the migratory bird work with waterfowl. He's the one that came up with the three of the four flyway systems, the Pacific, Central, Mississippi, and the Atlantic flyway. And that was a very important thing that he developed. He's got his photographer uh, on the left there and then the pilot on the right. But they did a lot of surveys in the late 30s doing prelimin preliminary work. After World War II, planes and pilots became very numerous. And then the, that's when we started the major nationwide surveys, not only on the wintering grounds, the midwinter surveys, but all the breeding ground work that was done up in uh, the Midwest, uh, in the prairies and into Canada. Surveys were conducted uh, ever since through the uh, late 40s up until the last two years. The national surveys were curtailed because of budget cuts and then also because of the COVID pandemic. And so it's unfortunate that we no longer conduct the midwinter survey. Maryland still maintains a survey of the Maryland part, but uh, it's not as widespread as the surveys were in the past. And so we're missing a lot of data based on the extensive uh, waterfall surveys that were conducted in the past. But now we're coming up with new ways uh, to analyze populations. Some of these surveys were important in determining the flock size, but also the sex ratio. And we learned that like with canvasback, a lot of the males were further north and females were further south. So you had not only a disparate sex ratio overall, which is around two males to every female, but even up uh, north, it would be much greater. It'd be like six males to females, but you can get down into South Carolina and you could have two female canvasbacks to one male. The important thing about knowing the sex ratio is you set your limits by the state. And so hunting regulations were established knowing what the sex ratio was. And so you can fluctuate your sex ratio, uh, typically considering a lot of hunters prefer getting a male, and, but you wanna limit your female uh, mortality as much as possible. And then also a lot of the work was done with body mass to determine how important that was in regard to survival. And of course, body mass, the weight of the birds is an important factor. Belrose was uh, considered the father of waterfowl conservation and management, and he came out with the first book, Ducks, Geese, and Swans of North America. It was actually followed up on some of the earlier work that Cartwright had done. He was a Canadian, but Belrose expanded and worked tremendously. And he, he followed into in Lincoln's footsteps in knowing more about the migratory patterns of waterfowl. And he came up with the concept of corridors that birds weren't definitely limited to stay in one flyway, but they had pathways or corridors that he called and that they would switch back and forth sometimes on their migration. And of course, a great example is, is what happens with the uh, tundra swans coming from Alaska into Chesapeake Bay and also the greater scoff, which 
breed in Alaska in the, in the Northwest and then come to Chesapeake Bay and other areas in the East. Give you a little taxonomy here. And Ciriformes is the big order that waterfowl come under. There's two other groups in different continents, the magpie goose and the screamers of South America. They are also considered in the Ciriformes order. In the family, there's 170 species uh, in, in anatidae. But in Chesapeake Bay, <clears throat> we're typically dealing with about three, three swan species, the trumpeter, tundra, and mute. And like I said earlier, the tundra swan was earlier the whistling swan. And in the geese, we have the Canada goose, snow goose, and the brant. And the snow geese are break, broken into the greater and the lesser. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Got one whistling duck that shows up occasionally in uh, Chesapeake Bay, and that's the fulvus tree duck, or now whistling duck. And then uh, puddle ducks with nine species. The diving ducks are broken into three major groups. The bay ducks, or the poachers, uh, consider that are, are made up of the two scorp species, canvasback, redhead, and then the ringneck duck. <clears throat> the sea ducks have 15 species in North America. And we have 10 species in Chesapeake Bay, and one stiff tail, the ruddy duck. We'll talk briefly about the three uh, swan species uh, that we have. The mute swan now is, is greatly reduced the number. It was quite high at one time, up around 4,500 birds. And now the state of Maryland and Virginia have reduced that number considerably. A lot of controversy that was involved with that and a lot of political uh, maneuvering back and forth based on who was governor of the state. The uh, tundra swan in the upper right-hand corner has that yellow mark on its, bill, on its face, not always available or always seen, but if it is seen, you're pretty sure you got a tundra swan. And now because there are some trumpeters that are showing up around different areas of Chesapeake Bay, but notice the big uh, cone-shaped black mark in front of the eye of the trumpeter swan, which makes them very distinctive. Here's a group of uh, tundra swans that are uh, over on South River. Uh, John Gudis is part of our group here tonight, and that's right at his house where he's been watching these birds for quite a few years. If you look closely at the bird on the right, you see a collar on its neck. This is a bird they've been watching for the last three or four years. It was a, a banded uh, and color marked uh, <clears throat> about, uh, I think it's uh, over 15 years ago, or maybe more than that. John can tell us more about that later, but that, that was uh, banded in another area that showed up in his area. But he and his wife were heavily involved working with Larry Heinemann, which is a state waterfowl biologist, and Christy Wilkins, who was a PhD student at the uh, Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, to do a satellite study on these birds. So they actually instrumented some birds at his house, and then they've been following them around uh, for quite a few years, the satellite birds and also the, the collared birds that were done in different areas. Here's a close-up of the collar bird in the upper left-hand corner. It's T186 been written up in the newspaper because it's been spotted in Annapolis and other areas. Hasn't shown up yet this year, but neither have the swans, so they should be showing up soon. Bill Sladen was very well known in the waterfall circles in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, that's him in the middle, and that's Bill King's son, and they're up in Alaska picking up a trumpet of swan. Bill had swans uh, at his house, at his ranch in Virginia, but then he also had some introduced into Chesapeake Bay. He became very well known for a lot of the work he did with the big waterfowl, the swans and geese. He was the basis of the, uh, the movie Fly Away Home because he did the ultralight tracking earlier where birds were following an ultralight during migration. So he became quite well known in this. He uh, had a lot of problems with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm not gonna go into that right now, but he also did a lot of penguin banding in, in uh, Antarctica. And uh, he thought he should put two bands uh, uh, band on each leg. If a bird's got two legs, why not band both legs? The Fish and Wildlife Service went crazy over that. If you want to know more about Bill Sladen, uh, I can send you a copy of his obituary. I was really honored to uh, be asked to write his obituary when he died a couple of years ago, and it's published in IBIS, the, the British uh, journal. The, uh, the editor in charge of the journal uh, gave me a nice compliment, and he said I was the most diplomatic uh, obituary writer he'd ever seen because I was very nice to uh, Bill Sladen and the Brits uh, weren't as friendly to their expatriate. He had come from uh, England, but settled at Johns Hopkins University where he was a surgeon. Anyhow, a lot of good stories about Bill Sladen. Uh, the trumpet of swans that uh, he brought in 
were once uh, located out around uh, on the eastern shore in, in the around eastern area. These are some new ones that have been spotted in Bowie and several other areas uh, in Chesapeake Bay that have come in from different areas. So there's still a few trumpet of swans around. Bill was also big on mute swans. He felt like uh, the state should not be killing mute swans and trying to control their numbers. But the best way to control them is to put uh, same sex pairs together on ponds. So if you had private property and you wanted mute swans, like a lot of people did, uh, then you would get two males or two females. Of course, most people poo pooed that because there were always some wild birds that could have flown in and mess up that sex ratio real fast. But that was something he pushed for a long time. Gay couples, he referred to them as, and, and uh, he was pretty well known about that. The mute swan, of course, came in uh, when it was released in the 1960s from private uh, holdings in the bay. And they got huge, large, powerful wings. They're very aggressive. And a lot of the problems with mute swan is the fact that their breeding season coincides with a lot of times when the people are getting out and enjoying wildlife activity. So they've been uh, pretty uh, maligned over the years. Interesting from a food habits point of view is that mute swans are predominantly vegetarians. Over 90% of their food is vegetarian. But when you look at the tundra swans in Chesapeake Bay, a very small amount, around 20% is vegetation. The rest is made up of Baltic pacomas and the other bivalves, mainly the Maya arenaria, the same clam that we eat, the soft shell clam. And in, if you ever fly over Chesapeake Bay, you can see areas where the tundra swans have been feeding because they either leave a, a very muddy water when they're churning up the bottom, or if it's uh, past uh, history, you can see where they've, uh, uh, where their burrows have been, where, they, where they've been digging into the, into the, uh, the substrate. The first can of the geese that we had as resident geese came into Patuxent from Blackwater Refuge. This is the first nesting pair at Patuxent Research Refuge in 1948. Since that time, there have been a lot of introductions and the population expanded considerably. So we're dealing with two populations of migratory uh, of, of Canada geese. We've got the migratory population and the non-migratory, which is the resident geese, or sometimes referred to as nuisance geese. The state of Maryland has done a big job in trying to control their numbers. It was a special problem on the Patuxent River and uh, Greg Kearns was involved with some of the control activities down there on the resident geese because they were causing problems in the bay. Uh, they were unique at Patuxent for many years. Uh, we had a, a master student who figured out that the population was a matriarchal population where the females were in control of who nested in the area. So you could have a lot of pairs nesting on the same pond, which is very unusual in the real wild world, but this is because they were raised uh, more in a, in a captive controlled environment and the females were in control. Another unique thing about Canada geese and some other birds that are in dense populations is the fact that they form a gang brood. This is when several pairs are together and then they have some disturbance, a car goes by or some, some loud noise and all the young goslings move to, the, to one pair. And then the other pair are left with a no young. So this is what's called a gang brood. Needless to say, it uh, has high mortality because uh, fox can easily pick off that number when there's that number and the adults can't protect them as well as they should. But one of the big problems with Canada geese, the resident geese, was that they caused destruction of the wild rice, especially in uh, the Patuxent River. And uh, a long time ago, Greg Kearns and Mike Harris came up with the idea of having explosions to see what effect the Canada geese were having. And you can see the marked change that took place inside the exclosure. They had huge, dense populations of dense stands of wild rice, where outside you can see how the Canada geese had chewed it up. Also, mute swans do the same thing. They've done it throughout Chesapeake Bay, and it's why mute swans have been so unpopular with a lot of the waterfowl managers in the bay. But this was a big breakthrough when Greg and Mike Harum has determined this because at, before that time, nobody really understood why the wild rice was disappearing. It's such an important food for so many organisms, so many birds, especially all the uh, blackbirds and the bobolinks that were so common in the past in Chesapeake Bay, and also the rails that are along the Patuxent River. But the wild rice is now coming back. Unfortunately, uh, 
they had to get rid of all the resident geese to do that because it was just too big of an area to exclude uh, with wire. So they had to ha actually have population control of the Canada's. The snow geese typically have come in, the greater snow goose is the Atlantic bird that comes in New Jersey, Delaware, and the coast of, of Maryland. In recent years, they've moved inland and the greater snow geese were found in tremendous numbers inland when they learned to feed on corn. Before that time, they were feeding on Spartina. They chewed up the, the base of the plant, ate the rhizomes, and they were heavily grazers in the salt marsh. But when, they, when corn became a big thing, after mechanical harvesting left so much corn in the field after harvest, then the geese moved into it just like the Canada geese had done. It's interesting to realize that when uh, Bob Stewart wrote his waterfowl report for Chesapeake Bay in 1962, he does not mention field feeding by any waterfowl. And it's just amazing when you think now that now we have field feeding by Canada geese, this, uh, mute uh, tundra swans and occasionally mute swans, and then the snow geese, and then the brant finally came in. So the Atlantic snow goose population came, came down and now it's moved inland in Delaware and in Maryland and in Virginia. Virginia uh, did have a, uh, a season on them and Maryland of course has had a season for a long time. The, it, the lesser snow geese has a small population around Blackwater, but most of them are down Louisiana in the central, in the Mississippi flyway. Here's, a, here's the most recent flock of uh, snow geese I've seen over in Centre, Centerville. This was January 9th, 9, 2021. I was just driving by and I saw them and got this uh, quick video of them. Brant have always been feeding on uh, either eelgrass or sea lettuce out in the salt areas. But in the late 70s, when we had a freeze, 77 was the worst freeze, when the coastal areas were badly frozen, the brant were starving in great numbers. And we estimated the mortality in New Jersey was around 50,000. A lot of the birds came up on people's lawns and were trying to eke out a winter existence, feeding on very low uh, energy food, the fiber of, of old grass. But that started the grazing of brant. And so that really took place in the late seven, 1970s. And now you still see Brant uh, out in fields and because so much of the, the vegetation in the salt water that they used to feed on has disappeared. So grazing of Brant become a more, more numerous in recent years. There's still some Brant in the Southern part of, of the Bay but most of them around Chincoteague in that area. Talk briefly about the puddle ducks uh, or dabbling ducks. Uh, they feed in the surface and probably a better name for them is the surface feeding ducks, just like we call a diving ducks based on their way of feeding. Uh, they jump uh, to flight. Uh, the only diving duck that will do that uh, sometimes is the uh, ringneck duck and the uh, hood and They both uh, can, can feed in small areas and they can get airborne by jumping up where most of the other ones have to run along the surface. The wood duck was the only duck that we had at Patuxent when Patuxent was formed back in 1936. And it was uh, one of the few breeding birds in the Chesapeake Bay area. Their population was very low in the early 1900s and people thought it was actually gonna become extinct. Uh, wood duck management with wood duck boxes is considered one of the most successful wildlife management stories that we've ever done in North America. And it, was, it wasn't only the duck nesting studies that were conducted at Patuxent, but it was also the impoundment management, creating impoundments that would hold the water back that could be drained in the summertime and with a process called moist soil management. This benefited the waterfowl that were using the areas in the fall and winter, but also was bene beneficial for the wading birds. We did our first telemetry study at Patuxent with wood ducks, and we learned that they had uh, some kind of distinct areas where they had nesting, like all, because all they needed was a nest box, but then they take their brood to another area where they had brood habitat. Black ducks are a native to uh, Chesapeake Bay. They're really dark brown. They're distinctive in having the white under the wing. So I'm sure you birders know that when you see them in flight, that white shows up really well. They also have distinct bill differences. These are two males. The female has a more model bill. We did a major study with black ducks at Patuxent in the 1960s, 
and it was the black ducts that were shown to have eggshell thinning because of the metabolite of DDT, which was called DDE. And so the DDE study with black ducts was the major thing that where protoxic biologists learned that eggshell thinning was because of DDE in the food chain. And so nobody really understood what was causing the decline in, in so many bird populations, but it wasn't so much the direct mortality from the pesticides, but it was the eggshell thinning that was causing poor productivity. And so there was no recruitment into the population. Black duck studies were also conducted in the uh, 1980s. Uh, there's sort of an interesting story where the Canadians were complaining about uh, all the acid rain that we were sending north. Uh, President Reagan was on the phone with some counterparts and he was constantly saying it wasn't our problem, it was their problem because the acid rain was coming from their areas. <clears throat> but we knew that we were sending a lot of uh, acid rain north. And the other thing is, uh, he said that we were studying the black ducks because the Canadians were very concerned about their black duck population. You can see their range here con considers, includes a tremendous part of Canada. After uh, Reagan got through talking to the Canadians and bragging about what we were doing, he then got on the phone with the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service and said, asked him what he was doing in regards to black duck studies. And the director said, well, we're not studying them. And Reagan said, well, you are now. And that was the beginning of our black duck studies in regards to acid rain. Defenders of Wildlife uh, tried to make a case of the fact that it was the acid rain that was causing the decline of black ducks. Uh, but we never said that in our publications. We said that invertebrate uh, were decreased in biomass and also diversity because of acid rain, but we could not make a direct link to the problem with the black duck decline. However, we knew that there were some problems with hunting and Defenders of Wildlife had a lawsuit against the Fish and Wildlife Service that the Fish and Wildlife Service won but actually they shouldn't have won it because we just had better attorneys than the defendants had at that time. But we knew that the waterfowl hunting was affecting the black duck population and we've had strict regulations on the black ducks ever since. We did a lot of work in New Jersey uh, dealing with winter conditions and also the problem with mallet hybridization with black ducks. Just talk briefly about some of the other puddle ducks. The blue winged teal, of course, we talked about earlier, they, they come through the bay very early, one of the first migrants that come in and then they spend their time down in South America, the Caribbean or other areas south. But they do nest here in Chesapeake Bay. So like the uh, gadwall, they are a nesting bird for Chesapeake Bay. There's only a few of them. So we don't have that many natives. The Canada goose and the mallet are not native birds for Chesapeake Bay. They were introduced later as nesting birds. The widgeon, of course, is another a bird that uh, in the bay, and we somebody talked all, earlier today about the pintails and the shovelers, and of course they're common in shallow areas. Craney Island down in Virginia and some of the sewage lagoons that Michelle was talking about are important areas for birds that are uh, feeding in shallow areas. The mallard's an introduced species uh, that's also a very big domestic bird. Now we find hardly can find pure mallards uh, anymore because they've been so interbred with the domestic mallard, which is, goes back probably three to 4,000 years. One thing that's unique is uh, the Pekin duck, which is the white bird. If you ever see a pair of Pekin ducks at parks, you wanna look at the uh, tail area. And if you see that curled uh, tail, then you know immediately that it's a male. The females don't have that little curl on the back of their tail. We did food uh, studies in regards to the availability in Susquehanna Flats in the uh, 40s and 50s at Patuxent. This is Bob Stewart, who was one of our major researchers. And he was out looking at this. This was a project that was taken on by the state DNR. They followed up and did that for a long time. We knew we had huge populations of waterfowl that used Chesapeake Bay. But when the vegetation disappeared, those populations disappeared. So Susquehanna Flat has nowhere near the hundreds of thousands of birds that were there originally. Even in the southern areas around Tangier Sound uh, and other areas south, we have tremendous vegetation that washes up on the beach in the past, but we don't see that 
in great amounts like we did in the past, as this windrow shows here. A lot of the uh, habitat for diving ducks base, is based on the depth of the water, but also the type of, of projections that are available for them. Uh, you see ruddy ducks and, uh, and ringneck ducks in the shallow ponds, uh, and, but out in the other open water, you see a, a change where the canvasbacks and scoff and ruddy ducks are in close to shore, then the bufflehead and golden eye further out, and then the long-tailed duck, the old, old squaw, and the scoters are out in deeper areas. And a lot of this is based on the food they're getting in this area. I'm not gonna go into too much details on that, but they're all filling different niches. And there is a lot of overlap, but uh, there are major differences between the type of food that they feed on. Audubon uh, spent a lot of time in Chesapeake Bay, and he was especially interested in the Baltimore area. This is a painting that he did on the canvasbacks. Uh, you see the sex ratio here is interesting. He's got two males to one female. He's got them up on rocks is something you won't see in Chesapeake Bay because they're mainly in the water all the time, but it makes a beautiful uh, setting for his artwork. The other thing he's got in here that's not uh, too uh, factual, not at all factual, is the fact that he's showing wild celery. This, he was sent wild celery uh, and with, uh, with the birds when he received the uh, killed canvasbacks. He didn't actually kill them himself. And he thought that the wild celery was an emergent plant, not a submerged plant. And so you can see how the birds are feeding from uh, grabbing it from the surface, not underwater, which of course they do. So this is one of the little mistakes that Audubon made, like some other ones in his paintings, but he was involved with so many birds that it's, you have to give him a lot of credit for what he did. This, is, this painting was done at, uh, in Baltimore Harbor, and that's supposed to be Fort McHenry and the Baltimore Harbor in the background. In the 1970s and 80s, we did a lot of work on feeding ecology of canvasbacks. Uh, I, I came to Patuxent because of the canvas pack. I was hired to do telemetry work early in the 1970s. And at that time, we had just received $200,000 from Roger C.G. C.B. Morton. He was our congressman from the Eastern Shore. So he, he really wanted more canvas packs. And we looked at the feeding ecology, food habits, and other issues. And we learned that canvas packs had switched their diet from a vegetation to mainly a mollusk diet. We also learned about their endogenous rhythm by having birds in captivity. And we knew that birds were losing weight in the wintertime and then gaining it back in the spring. And that in the wintertime, they also fed less. So you see these rafts where sometimes they're just sleeping all day long in what's called a pseudo sleeping posture. But when we did, when we did a captivity study, we found the exact same behavior, even though we had given them food ad libitum. They could eat as much food as they wanted to but they still lost weight and they still slept a lot during the daytime. We did color marking studies. You can see a, a blue canvas back here and another blue canvas back here. We had red canvas backs and yellow canvas backs and we had different colors in different parts of the bay to learn more about the distribution of the bay and how they were migrating. This is a uh, three traps that I had down in Persimmon, actually four traps, one's empty, four traps down at Persimmon Point in the Potomac River. Did a lot of banding. Uh, this is uh, canvas back being banded here by one of my assistants and here's Mike Harris taking redheads uh, out of a trap down in the Chop Tank River. <clears throat> we worked with a portable fluoroscope in a van and traveled all over the country looking at ingested shot as well as embedded shot in birds, uh, mainly the canvas backs, but we did other species too. And what we found was that the embedded shot was cumulative. And so you could have a duck that's got shot in it, embedded in, in its flesh. So you can see his uh, six of them in this, uh, I mean, of, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's supposed to be six. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, I had the names covered. So his uh, uh, six large shot here and these shots here in the abdominal cavity look like they're a little smaller. Here's a gizzard over here. So these are not gizzard shot, this was shot. And I ca caught this adult male on the Mississippi River, it weighed uh, 1,600 grams, which is quite large for canvasbacks. It was in great health, even though he had been hit twice by uh, hunters. I took it to a vet because I wanted to get this radiograph 
because the, the fluoroscope didn't take, make radiographs. You could just see how many that were in the bird. And he was amazed. And when, he, when I left, he wanted to give the bird antibiotics. And I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with this bird. He's in great shape. He's a survivor. And so the, the, the vet was sort of intrigued with the fact that it wasn't a recent in, injury that had taken place probably a long time ago. Ruddy ducks are a unique uh, diver in the bay. Uh, they're in a group by themselves, as I mentioned earlier, stiff tails. One of the things I got interested in through a friend of mine at the Smithsonian was the fact that their bill might have electrosensitivity in it. And so uh, this woman, uh, Helen James, who was working on Hawaii, Hawaiian birds had talked about the fact that some birds historically had this ability to sense electrical charges in invertebrates. And of course, you know about the duckbill platypus and some other uh, interesting species that have this ability. So we did a preliminary study in a dive tank at Patuxent and we found out that the ruddy ducks actually went to an area where we had an electrical charge, 65% compared to the uh, quadrants where we didn't have it, 35%. I think I've got a video, hopefully it'll show show you <clears throat> of the birds diving. You can see how we divided the dive tank and then the birds would dive down in, into the water and uh, pick up the uh, charge that was, uh, it, that was located under the, that black board in the background. I think this is loading, I'm not sure it's gonna go, but we had a charge, a small battery charge on this uh, end of the board that was hidden. The bird couldn't see it, but we felt like the bird was being attracted to it, just like a small electrical charge that an invertebrate might give off in the water. Doesn't wanna go, it's taking its time to, to load. It's loading, but I'll, I'll move on. So anyhow, the main point was that uh, a lot of the birds did go to uh, a charge. Unfortunately, this project was never finished. Uh, the man who was doing a lot of the electrical work uh, I had set the whole project up with a dive tank and got the birds, but we had an engineer who was actually doing the electrosensitivity part of the study, and he got into a problem at Patuxent, and eventually he left, and then somebody else came in and then took all our data, so all the data disappeared. Another one of those sad stories. Now, it's not the program. I just lost the program. I guess you can see that. Well, there's B and screen sharing will stop. Hi, Matt. I don't, it's Marcia. I don't know why that happened. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm sharing screen. Forget if I hit the uh, PowerPoint first or there it is. Uh, I'll try to wrap this up. Um, I know I've got a lot of slides in here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I want to talk briefly about food habits. Uh, well, I want to just mention some um, work about the, uh, the this other sea duck, surf scoter, black scoter, white wing scoter, and long tailed duck. And these are our, were our four major uh, sea ducks in Chesapeake Bay, but we also have the uh, golden eye and the bufflehead, which are a major species. And of course, the common eider are found in some areas. There's four other, three other species of eider. We have king eider occasionally in the bay, some recordings of it, but the other two eiders are only up in oh, Northwest in Alaska. We've got three species of uh, mergansers, the hooded merganser, and then the common and the red breasted and the hooded is mostly in freshwater small ponds. We did a study on harlequins because we were concerned about the yellow shore crab that uh, exists in Oregon, as its name indicates. And harlequins are really a West Coast bird. We have a, a small population that comes down into Maine and occasionally we'll see them in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we had one in Annapolis about 10 or 15 years ago. And then they're also seen down on the uh, bay uh, the tunnel bridge uh, going across Chesapeake Bay. But uh, they've not picked up on the waterfall surveys because they're so in such few numbers. 
but we were interested in what would happen if the yellow shaw crab disappeared because of the invasive green crab, which is on both coasts now that came from Europe. And they've wiped out a lot of the scallops up in, in Massachusetts, in, uh, on the islands, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, and they're becoming a problem on the West Coast. But we learned that uh, the study that was done by Allegra showed that even though the, uh, the green crab was not as beneficial as the shore crab, the birds could exist okay, and they would probably get enough nutrition from, from that. The problem with other species like the canvasbacks and the other sea ducks is the fact that a lot of our oyster populations have disappeared. We're now dealing with about 1% of the past productivity of oysters in the bay. This has a major effect on hook mussels, as you can see in the esophagus of a canvasback here. I mean, I'm sorry, of a, a, a sea duck. This is a scoda, and it's a major food, and it occurs on oysters. So the hooked mussels are attached to oysters. So as the oysters disappear, the hook mussels are disappearing. So that's a problem. We've done tremendous uh, food habits work in documenting the changes that have taken place. And you can see also changes in the parts of the bay, where in the northern part, like up around Herring Bay with surf scotas, there's a lot of hook mussels. And then as you go down the bay, the uh, chop tank, there's less. And then there's, then there's fewer further down. Uh, and you start getting a small amounts of hook mussels where other species start coming into more uh, prominence as you're moving down the bay into more saline waters. Here's a dive tank study we did with, can, uh, with surf scoters. They're feeding on hook mussels that we had glued to oyster shells that were embedded in the concrete. And we had these birds trained to go and actually pull the, the mussels off and feed on them. And then we also had them trained to go into sand and to feed on another clam, the mulinia. And so the, the surf clam is another major food of the canvasbacks that they fed on. This bird was uh, almost like a, he was called Hoover because he was like a vacuum cleaner sucking up all the uh, clams that were in, in the water. Not sure why that's playing again. Uh, the the one of the problems with the uh, the scoters and the old spar is they nest the long-tailed ducks is they nest so far north that we had to use satellite telemetry and other techniques to capture them. They would not go into uh, corn, and we wanted to study them so we could track them with satellite telemetry. We use floating mist nets and then a net gun technique that put out a net with four projectiles. And then we also did a lot of night lighting. Here's just a video of capturing a, uh, this is a long tail dog, the first shot that shot missed. It, I thought it was a, a capture, but you can see the bird was knocked down, but then it flew, flew away. The white wing scoter, here's a shot that it was captured. In slow motion, you can see the bird flapping at the end of the video because he's inside the net. And then we have to immediately go back and, and grab the net and pull the bird in because the projectiles will sink and you got to get them real fast before you lose your bird. We did night lighting. And uh, the main thing with the night lighting was uh, as we started out with major lights on the boat initially, but then we learned that you could be a lot more successful if you had a small amount of light. And so we went to the extremes at first thinking that you had to uh, light up the whole, not the night, but when we had just a spotlight and held it right on the birds, we were more successful. This is working with Black Skoda in New Brunswick. We couldn't find Black Skodas in Chesapeake Bay, even though there were some here. And historically, there were very few of them in the bay when we were doing a study. So we went to Canada and, and did our study up there. Then the birds were taken into captivity, where into a lab where we put uh, implanted uh, transmitters inside the bird. You can see them antenna coming out. So this was an implanted uh, transmitter with a percutaneous antenna, the antenna coming through the skin. We did this with long-tailed ducks. And it was a very effective technique. You can see on this map, the movement of the birds going north and south. Uh, this is over a, a four year period. You can see them going all the way down the Atlantic coast, but then going back up into Canada in the spring and major, major areas along the Hudson Bay area. 
So this is a, a study that we did uh, throughout the, the 90s and into the, the early part of this uh, uh, millennium. But when we banded birds and instrumented them in Chesapeake Bay, we found out that there was a different movement. Instead of going up the coast, they went to the Great Lakes and then into the Hudson Bay and then up the coast. So you can see the spring migration and, and those red dots way up north, that's a long-tailed duck way up north and some of the other ones uh, are further south uh, and during where the Hink stayed around the uh, Hudson Bay and especially the Churchill area, which is over here in Manitoba. I worked up in Churchill for six years for two or three weeks at a time. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we learned was that no immature males were ever recorded in the Churchill area. And this was based on my study, which was done over a six year period, but also another study that was done by Dr. Allison. He never found immature males. These are actually second year males. And, uh, immature is really a bad term for them because they're, they're uh, considered the second year. So uh, immatures would have been the ones that were hatched that year, but this is from the previous year, no males. And so it indicates <clears throat> that the female is taking the males, uh, taking uh, her young, her offspring up with her, but not the males. The males stay back at the Great Lakes or in the East Coast in the St. Lawrence River. And this is the true with other sea ducks they are not taking the immatures, that first year birds up, because there's no reason. The females are in control. They take the young, their offspring up, their off, female offspring, but not the males. The sex ratio was around two to one, which is similar that we see in a lot of ducks. Some of the problems we have, of course, of oil pollution. We've had major problems in the 1970s, uh, and now global climate change is causing problems, and the, the still out, the jury's still out on the wind turbines. We don't know if it's going to be a beneficial or not. It could be providing a lot of food resources. Uh, Alicia Berlin, who's a PhD student under me when I was working, she's doing a lot of follow-up work with wind turbine work. And they're also doing work with uh, underwater acoustics to see if the wind turbines could be causing noise underwater. Labrador duck, <clears throat> fortunately, is the only, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice here, so I'm going to wrap up shortly. <clears throat> the Labrador duck is the only bird that's become, only waterfowl species that's become extinct. They don't think it was from hunting. Uh, it wasn't a preferred bird, although it was in the market sometimes. They think it was mainly egg collection, which was so big in Europe. And a lot of the birds were, the, the nests were robbed for egg collectors in Europe. Of course, the public sees a lot of waterfowl at park areas. Uh, we'd like to get them more into the wild and see waterfowl in the wild. But this is an increasing problem that we have educating the public about the problems that we have with waterfowl and the loss of habitat. And as long as our human population keeps increasing, we're going to be having more problems with habitat in the bay. I, I just uh, mentioned some of the people that uh, worked with me. That's me up in the top there when I was doing some net gunning work. Mike Haramis uh, worked with us. He was a, a major waterfowl biologist. Our vet was Glenn Olson. Pete Ossington did all the food habits work that I showed you. And uh, David Kidwell did his master's on some of the depth uh, studies with long-tailed ducks. Alicia Berlin was a PhD student under me and she did all the dive tank work. And she's now one of the uh, managers at Patuxent. Dan Day was uh, one of our assistants and Ed Lonis was another assistant. So these are the group of people that we had working with us. We had a great team and uh, we did a lot of fun work and it's, uh, we, we learned a lot about Waterfall of the Bay, but there's an awful lot that we don't know. And uh, it involves a lot more study and a lot more money, which has been in short supply in recent years. So I'll wrap that up. And if there's any uh, questions, I'd be happy to uh, give you some, or give you some answers if I can. If I can't, I'll be happy to do a little more research for you. Uh, I'd love to get email. So if you want to contact me by email, I'll be happy to communicate with you on any waterfall issues. We uh, have a population in Chesapeake Bay for a long time. It's been around a million birds, million waterfowl. It's still around that number, but uh, about half that number are Canada geese. And so this is a, uh, a, a bird that's adopted, adapted very well to the corn and uh, humans in the Bay Area, and they can survive very well because they, they can get by with short time feeding if they're feeding on corn. So I will end there. If you have any questions or anything else? <clears throat>
Well, Matt, on behalf of everyone, let me thank you. It's Marshall again. Let me thank you for an excellent, really overwhelmingly excellent presentation. Uh, I certainly learned things I had never heard before about waterfowl. So I hope um, other people learn some new things as well. If you want to um, stop sharing your screen, I think we can go back to gallery view and invite people to ask questions. No questions have come into the chat. So I'll just invite people to unmute themselves and they can speak their questions if there's anything they'd like to discuss. I have a question. Here's but, Michelle. But first a comment, I agree with Moshe. That was just wonderful. That was really, really good. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate the time you put into it. Um, you talked about the, the mute swans. I'm kind of curious. When I first moved here in 1999, there were still a fair amount of mute swans around. And now we never see them, which uh, I went to Cape May recently. And there were all kinds of them up there. So obviously, you kind of implied it's kind of a state level uh, thing. But you also commented that uh, there was some Maryland politics. I was curious if you are free to uh, expound on that a bit to edify those of us. Uh, happy to. The, uh, the state has uh, reduced the population from around 4,500 to around 500 right now. They'd like to get it down to around zero. But uh, most of the mute swans now in the Bay are on private land that they can't get to. Uh, the, the politics that were involved was really a classic uh, liberal conservative politics. When Glenn Denning was the governor, uh, he, well, he, <laughs> he had just gone through a divorce. He had a, uh, a female friend who was a, a Peter member. She was very protective and she got his ear and he was just totally against any control on mute swans, even though uh, most of the bird groups uh, supported control, just like I worked for Rhode Island Fish and Game for uh, two years after I got out of the Navy. And the biggest support we got was from the Rhode Island Audubon Society. They wanted control on the mute swans because they knew what damage they were doing to other species, mainly because they shouldn't, we shouldn't have waterfowl grazing in Chesapeake during the summertime. And that's the problem. And also stomping on, on nests because they're so big, they were in uh, areas on beaches and all where they were nesting birds. So the, the problem was all biologists, most all biologists wanted control on mute swans. Glenn Denning didn't. When Ehrlich became governor, he immediately started uh, control. Uh, Larry Hyman was the state biologist. He was uh, a little arrogant at the time and he got caught uh, <laughs> killing birds on private property. And this made big news. Uh, it was a caused the end of the project for a while, but then they started up again and they were much more covert on their operation and uh, successfully killed over 4,000 birds oh, in the time. So um, shotguns, uh, egg oiling and egg addling did not work. The population was still increasing. Uh, I was on the, the management committee on that and uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, a lot of angst going on because we had the Humane Society uh, fighting with us, and there was also another group uh, out of uh, Connecticut, I think, that was uh, that was against all control. Interestingly, uh, very little uh, concern when we wanted to kill nutria, and so it shows the difference between a marsh rat and a beautiful white swan on Chesapeake Bay. It's a major uh, human I issue, and uh, it's very easy to understand. I mean, they are beautiful birds, so there's no doubt about it. Do you think uh, New, New Jersey is going to do the same at some point? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I guess I haven't followed New Jersey lately. I know if uh, my old friend up there, if he was still in control, he... He would uh, certainly do it, uh, but I, I don't know what the status is now. I know Rhode Island was the first state that started controlling them and uh, other uh, New England states followed and then Chesapeake Bay with uh, Maryland and Virginia. I don't know about New Jersey though. It was just after, after not having seen any for so many years, it was kind of jarring to see them again. <laughs> well, you know, if they're in a 
in a, in a city area, that's where it becomes a problem. You know, mute swans are huge in Japan too. And they're in, in areas where they can't be controlled or people don't want to control them. They get too attached to them. Uh, just like uh, monkeys in some areas or deer in an area, they, people get attached to them and they lose sight of the fact that they're, that they're wild animals and they don't belong in, in these uh, uh, areas and at the numbers that they're at. So that becomes the, the controversy and it's, uh, it can get real ugly fast. Yeah. I can't, I can't remember, maybe you mentioned it. Uh, were, they, were they brought over, released in the wild on purpose or was it, was it just uh, escapees from people's farms or whatever? I think they, it was escape from a storm. I forget what year that was, but the original birds came over just like the starling and the English sparrow uh, somebody, I forget who, I forget the story, but it was essentially somebody wanted to import all the birds that Shakespeare had mentioned in his plays. And so that's how we got a lot of the uh, European birds. It, it was considered more of a, uh, a nice thing to have in the United States. People didn't understand uh, the invasiveness of some species at that time. Yeah. Thanks. Matt, I was... I was impressed with your telemetry maps showing the migration pathways of the ducks. Um, and I was very impressed with the number of dots on the maps. How many birds did you have in those telemetry studies? Well, we did, uh, when I was involved, uh, which was uh, early in, in two, I guess I started in the nineties up into uh, the end of, two, I guess, 2000, uh, and six is when I ended. Anyhow, we had over 100, I think there was 130 that we instrumented. That's a, with uh, surf scotas, uh, black scotas, which all came from New Brunswick, and then uh, long tail ducks and uh, white wing scotas were not, we, we captured that one white wing scota that I showed the shot on, but we didn't catch many of them. And so we never instrumented white wing scotas. But they did up at the St. Lawrence. They had quite a few white wing scoters up in the St. Lawrence that they captured. But uh, I think we had around 130. But you get uh, a lot of those uh, dots that you can get an awful lot of data with satellites. The problem is, is some of it's not good. And so we have programs that eliminate a lot of the, the so called the, the spurious uh, sightings that we have, and they're eliminated in this program. So. All the ones that we have are considered really good ones. They're good sightings. I mean, that number of waterfowl, uh, the reason I'm impressed is I know that that number of waterfowl represents a lot of work to catch the birds and to implant them and then to study them and follow them. That's well, the an other, amazing, massive work. Asha, the, the other point is to have the money to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. implanted transmitters are $3,000 a piece. Yep. We made stakes with them sometimes and you can lose a lot of money. You've got to have some administrators that are pretty understanding about the, uh, the, the problems with doing field research and, and we're only human and we're trying to do something that nobody done before and it's it's problem. You know, I did work in, in Argentina. I worked for a billionaire down there and he had no problem with funding us. He was giving us 250000 a year and so we were... We were <laughs> flying into uh, Argentina with $40,000 worth of transmitters. And wow. <laughs> we had to hide them because people wanted money and they were gonna charge us, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. real. Anyhow, the, it takes a lot of money to support projects like that. And, and we certainly don't have it in recent years. No. Hopefully increasing with the new budget. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Other people oh. have questions? How long does it take to, for the, I assume it was the, the vet was doing the implant thing. How long does it take to implant one on one, 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 one individual? Each bird is about an hour to do it and uh, to get them uh, sedated. And, uh, and you have to, my job was always assisting the vet and, and making sure that the uh, anesthesia was at the right amount and the bird was breathing properly. You have to be very careful with it. We worked out some interesting techniques and and uh, you have to keep uh, oxygen coming in with the anesthesia all the time. And so it takes about an hour, but it was a, it was a good technique. I did uh, a lot of work with canvasbacks with backpacks and we learned early on, you cannot put a backpack on a diving bird. 
because even though it works out with so many birds like the rails, like Greg Kearns is doing and all the puddle ducks and geese, it's easy to do on birds that aren't going underwater. But when they go underwater, the water follows that wire and it goes right to the skin and they stop diving. And they spend all their time on shore trying to get the harness off. Mm. And so there's been two studies that have been done by Canadians because they didn't believe my paper that it was ineffective. And I made it real clear, you know, nobody should be using uh, uh, harnesses, loop harnesses uh, on diving ducks. And, uh, and it, but they, they've repeated it and found the same results. And that's why we went with the implants. There's actually an Alaskan person who, who figured that out. And uh, one of a female biologists up in Alaska Science Center, she worked that out very well with the vet up there. And they found out a huge flock of eiders that they weren't even aware of through the satellite telemetry. And that's the advantage of it. In our study with surf scoters, we had one bird that showed up on the northern part of Labrador, Newfoundland. And the Canadians were checking my data. I had all the data put up uh, on the website. I didn't know they were checking it. And they called me up and they said they had just done a flight to find this one bird that I had on the coast of Labrador, they found 30,000 surf scoters that they didn't know about. So mm -hmm. it was just amazing. One bird revealed a population that they weren't even aware of. But satellite telemetry is, is great. It, 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 the problem with it is that everybody wants to do it and sort of it's a fun thing. You gotta have good uh, reason to do it. We, we were doing it mainly to delineate the populations for hunting regulations, because we thought a lot of the scoters were all mixed up in Canada and they could go down the Atlantic or the Pacific flyway. And we learned that they were pretty separate, which is what you sort of expect. They, birds are traditional. They don't, they don't mix around and go different areas. They, they come to the same area over and over again. I remember uh, George Jonko, who was chief of the bird banding lab for a long time, uh, somebody once said, uh, why don't, uh, during the 1970s, when we had those major freezes, why don't the birds go south? And he looked at the birds and says, they don't know where the groceries are down there. And it's so important when you think about that, you got to know where the groceries are. If you're <laughs> flying into a different area and you've never been there before, it's pretty bad, you know, but when you're, when you're, when your parents or other birds showed you where it is, and you can come back to that exact same area. The same thing and when they go to the breeding grounds. We've had birds go back to the same pond and sometimes nest in the same corner of the pond. And it shows the traditional nature of the birds. That's cool. Anyone okay. else? Here, Marsha, but I enjoyed talking to your group and it's, uh, it's been fun. Oh. We loved having you, Matt. You, you, you are such a wealth of information. Thanks a lot. A lot of information. That was great, Matt. That was great. That was great. That's great. That's good. Okay, well then. Thank, thank you, Matt. All right. Thank you very much. Good. I'll see you all. Take care. Stay thank safe. Thank you, Matt. We'll be talking. <laughs>